Hello everyone, welcome to Heart's Happiness Podcast. The place where I, Mary Preet, share my journey of healing intergenerational family trauma to help you to understand your story. I share a bunch of tools and tips that will transform your mental health and allow you to find your own heart's happiness. So exciting, right? Each episode will cover one of three areas. One, raising awareness of what this trauma actually is and how it hides in our lives. Two, tools, tips, support, lots of different things that I've used to get better and heal from this trauma. And three, I'll be connecting you with so many specialists and therapists and coaches as guests on my show. So we are going to transform your mental health and empower you to take your healing by the hands and move forward. Welcome back everyone. I have a special episode today. My friend Rav that I went to school with and is back on the podcast about a year since I had her on the last time talking about becoming a cycle breaker mother, which is very exciting because that's the way we can end into the impact of intergenerational trauma in our families. If you are new to my podcast, welcome. We are into episode number 80 now. So there's lots of episodes for you to catch up on that are really worth going back to the beginning and listening from there because there's so much information about intergenerational trauma, about fear, about changing our behavior, about finding our own happiness. You want to go all the way to the beginning and start from there to get a full experience. I like to think it's like a course altogether, so do enjoy. And also just a couple of announcements. In today's episode, Rav and I do talk about, um, you know, our own struggles to say no and the struggles of um, not having boundaries as a mother, etc. And I have a great workshop coming out on Tuesday, the 28th of March from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. UK time, where we will be going through why we don't say no and how we can change that. So it's, a, it's 35 pounds a ticket and they are on sale now. And I also have 100 pounds off my signature eight week course where I take you through my own process of um, walking through trauma and changing it, which me and Rav touched upon quite a lot in this episode. So if you wanna have more details, they're in the episode notes and there's a hundred pounds off at the moment. So it's 297 pounds for a course that starts at the end of April. Anyway, I'm now going to hand you over to Rav. We have my lovely friend Rav back on the podcast after about a year um, because she's one of my favorite mums because I love the way that um, she's doing it all. And I wanted to invite you on to talk about your story to becoming a mum how that how trauma has impacted you your relationship with your mum and all those good things so did you want to introduce yourself again because some people may not have heard that first episode that we did and explain who you are and what it is that you do yay uh thanks for having me again um I feel like it's going to become an annual thing (laughs) yes it should be uh we're going to start a series I'm Rav Neat I'm Neat Nutrition I support women in overcoming body confidence issues, their path towards self-realization, self-acceptance, not the same as body positivity. Um, And I do believe that stems from postnatal body trauma. Non-mums, because body issues are not restricted to just people, women that have babies. And what's interesting about our conversation today, Manpreet, is in starting to work with women because of the way I thought about my body after babies, mm. actually unlocked that this was a intergenerational lifetime trauma issue. Yes, yeah, not just a mother issue. Yeah, exactly. sure. Because, well, I've struggled with it and I'm not a mum. But, but I can see already where I'm thinking about planning to have a child and that my body changing and all of that is already bringing stuff up because it's so... Um, yeah. deep the wound around all of that and like body trauma and um you know what we've all had significant trauma from being told that we should look and be a certain way since we were so young right so yeah. it runs really deep when I started it was all going to be sports and nutrition mm. and helping weight loss because back then in 2019 that was a priority for me Mm. and it's almost like I have immersed myself in this for so many years after having children so dysfunctionally that Mm. now I have the science and a functional way to support people I want to share this with everyone Mm. really quickly I realized this is bs like Mm. I don't 
no, I don't want to create skinny people. No. I, I want to support women in finding their inner, like, lioness, right? Like, Yeah, well, I guess you want to help people just, you know, be happy with their body, bodies no matter what they what size they are. I mean, I think we were yeah. talking, me and you were talking about this the other day. Like, I don't want to have to be, I want to enjoy my wedding no matter what size I am. Like, and not, I look at pictures of the past and being like, God, I was so horrible to myself and I didn't even look yeah. bad. And it's yeah. that, I guess that's what you're trying to do is get that person out of their heads. <laughs> And, and and really quickly on this journey in speaking to the new mum, we were like, well, actually, who are you? Do you remember yourself before kids? But that also applies to, do you remember yourself before marriage? Do you remember yourself before engagement? Do you remember yourself before uni? And these, you know, incremental milestones in our lives mm. where identity has shifted, but we just were never taught or shown to sit and actually reflect what that means for us. Mm. So it took, it takes, and it, and it took me back to that zero to seven and you do this work. Mm. Everything is around that zero to seven age. Yeah, birth, definitely. Towards seven, and the programming of our subconscious mind, our beliefs about ourselves. So that's why it's not restricted to when you have your baby. Like, no, no. This stuff is just there manifesting. Well, I just, uh, like even with my own clients, um, the women that I've seen that have had children and struggled with postnatal is just it's basically like I feel like they take took the lid off a shaped up bottle so once you had the baby oh. it just goes crazy because but it's the trauma was already there but it goes yeah. get so it's like the the birth because obviously that's a trauma in itself it's such a big it's trigger mm. so it's such a big trigger that it unearths your other traumas that's what I've because I, I see a few people that have experienced postnatal and I always I'm like I'm not a postnatal um, trauma expert but I know about trauma and what that's happening is it's just been so I wonder if that's was that the start of your healing journey then your postnatal yeah um so I mean I I sought therapy and counselling when I was working at the bead as much like yourself please <laughs> uh, so in my early twenty. Mm. I, I just knew something didn't feel right. I started understanding that maybe some things in my childhood are just not your everyday stuff. So I had a, my mum, a parent who had significant mental health issues. Like my mum and I talk about this and we've talked on other podcasts together. She suffered from depression. Uh, her transition into this country and marriage and motherhood was really, really challenging. Um, and I was always compared to my mum. Like you look like her, you're like her, you're like her. So you can imagine, it's quite, quite traumatised with the idea that, oh my God, history's going to repeat itself. No idea of intergenerational trauma, and it probably in some aspect would. So motherhood and having postnatal depression just made that link that much more significant, aware, mm. conscious. But in, the, in my 20s, I didn't connect with my counsellor. As a white mm. male, I, I, I did not see my twenties. It was just that waste of time. Thank you, th thank you, man. Pretty like hello. Yeah, it was such a waste of time. Um, I mean, it was it's all right. I just spoke about my. It was just all right. I, I, didn't, get, I didn't touch any trauma. It was just thank about, you. I tried not to cry. Um, yes, yeah, putting on your best face. Yeah, you, you, and you all I was doing just... was taking our people pleasing into into a therapy. Thing. Yeah, yeah, I bet. I I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. Okay, I'm just gonna tell you because just like and I and I guess. I didn't know there were different modalities to therapy. I mm. just knew something didn't feel right. And I knew that because I had very volatile behaviors. I had very mm. emotionally unstable behaviors. You were um, married by this point as well, because you got married quite young, didn't you? Yeah, I, you I think I, this is before marriage. Mm. Maybe there was the onset of some substance abuse going on there as well. Like, you know, so honestly, I'm, and that, and this is the other thing around trauma. We we don't pop, we we block off a lot of stuff. Like oh yeah, yeah. from recall memory. Yeah, yeah 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 definitely. Um, I then got married, and that just exacerbated all the issues mm. because you can't swap out one family for another. It just doesn't work that way. Your trauma goes everywhere you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And then also, as you married into the to the same culture, there's a lot of that same just doubled up, right? Doubled up. Yeah. on both sides of the family but in different guess, ways guess how you might guess how you act in a marriage 
yeah exactly. exactly the way your parents did yeah yeah of course like almost like you're just like a little minion <laughs> it's like yeah also it's like to me it's still really like dumbfounds me the fact that we are so brainwashed yes because of those beliefs between zero and seven get your education get a good job get engaged get married everything's going to be happily ever after and then what no it's not yeah there's no no one ever talks about what happens next after that either (laughs) um but and like that's why so many people find when they're in their like 30s and where like yourself obviously this wasn't my experience but you know where you've done all the things that you were supposed to do you've ticked all those things off your list and then you're just like I'm actually um really miserable (laughs) and I've got like everything I was meant to have did you feel like that yeah 100 I was like I feel really unhappy and at two years I think it was the it was the peak of unhappiness and I'm not adverse to therapies and intuitive connection right so I just knew that I needed some support and I needed some help and I just don't think I knew where to go Mm. Mm. and I and Mampri even though I understand about self-development and whatnot because I was constantly looking for ways that I could change me fix me I just I didn't know the level of trauma I still wasn't acknowledging that my childhood was full of trauma that could be things like you you give us so many examples you talk about this and I think that's why I like to bring you in because I think so many women Asian women don't recognize what they're normalizing like yeah trauma. silent trauma it's trauma yeah uh, being told to get married at a certain age trauma trying being told yeah. to marry a certain person trauma I yeah. mean it's it's the thing I mean it's all big or small it's trauma isn't it it's it's whatever makes your body feel like it's under threat and that is that is trauma so it could be one thing for you like for me if I'm you know I'm much better now but if I'm near two adults to a man and wife arguing that is so (gasps) triggering for me I can't yeah. but now I'm so much better because I like just have a good deep breath walk walk away but that used to be really triggering for me but that might not be your experience yours might be something a little bit different and that's like yeah. we're all different but it's all important it's still um enough to have an impact yeah. on you because like how many people in our community especially was like oh it's not that bad oh, I hear this all the time it's not that all bad the time. I didn't have it that bad because I didn't get beaten up black or blue yeah that's okay you don't have to be black or blue to have significant trauma that it can affect your happiness right boom and so I, I i was using binge eating as a coping strategy is young I, I can remember it's the youngest seven eight nine mm, right me too um because it's soothing. That fullness yeah the numbing so i remember even last year and given that i've done different therapies I love therapies because you, know? mm, um, you know if it's in there and we talked just before we came on about it can be in our bodies it can present ourselves itself in so many different ways you can hear my gut bacteria story yeah my, mm. my gut bacteria story um the way we internalize our trauma into organs and health issues so I remember talking to my therapist last year and they're saying yeah that I think that only happened like once or twice. <laughs> this is me after years of different therapies. She goes, yeah, it's not the frequency. Yeah, once <laughs> is enough. <laughs> like, mm. But in that moment of reflecting on my own journey, you go into that child state. Yeah, yeah. And in that moment, you think, sometimes I think this is part of the trauma. Is that a big deal then? Hmm. Like if it was once. Yeah. How many well, times did she do that? How many times did those things happen? Mm, I mean, I find I see this with my clients a lot because I'm just like, I will literally just be like, that is a big deal though. And they're just like, their brains are like, <laughs> because they're yeah. just like, somebody is telling me that that actually wasn't my fault and that 
you know a different reality which is more supportive to you really because that's the thing when you're in therapy it's a more supportive reality to realize that actually maybe my mom and dad were just not all right and it wasn't because they didn't love me or care about me it's because they just weren't all right because of other things nothing to do with me um which is why therapy is like well just working with someone is amazing because they give you that other perspective yeah and it can be so profound so i mean it's like the gateway drug right People think they're coming to talk about food. Not I did. Thought mm. I was learning about food because I had two children. Mm. And it really brought up for me. I had so many negative thinking patterns as a mum. You know when you're when you're growing up and you suffer a depression. So I it was very evident to me really quickly. Oh, oh, you've clearly had lots of depressive episodes your whole life except you hibernate. So I would just go into, yeah, significant introversion. I could stay in my room for days. I'd look Mm. after myself. I could maintain hygiene, eat. And this is the thing with us as high functioning women in the South Asian community, often high functioning anxiety. We may appear to be fine, but in our own ways, we are doing something to regulate. Mm. For me, it would be, sitting in my room for days yeah I remember my best friend saying that to me she was like when she lived with me she was like I remember you just wouldn't come out of your room for days I was mm. like yeah probably me just trying to recalibrate yeah <laughs> yeah before before get, before, yeah yeah before you could get back out again and deal with it deal with all the things that you were doing that was probably triggering you anyway and you know being kind of considered to be an extrovert because I'm sociable but actually some of that in itself is a trauma response be liked mm. smile engage um and i think it's really i think people find it a little bit unu- like probably find it hot um unusual i spend so much time on my own still now because mm. even if we have public profiles it's it is just that self-regulation having time and for me it's a conscious act to slow down because I just look at my 20s and we were just like what you've described. Go, go, go. Achieve, achieve, achieve. Mm. Why am I so miserable? <laughs> like, yeah. why? I mean, I do. So I sort of um, I think as well, like for women like yourself that did do that, like get married young and have children um, younger um, that. I sort of feel like that often they'll be like, oh, do I not? Is it my husband then? Or is it my partner? Because um, he must be the problem. Is that, did you experience that? Yeah, I hear that a lot. So I knew part way that it was me, but then it's that thing around where we engaged and we argue, but when we get married, it'll be different. We'll be living together. Like I said, in two years. Yeah, because you're not allowed to live together because that's a cultural yeah. expectation. <laughs> you can be sexually, sexually active. 24 hours oh no like 10 hours before you applied red lipstick and wore a red wedding outfit but apparently before that we don't do that it's just so you know we're prepubescent literally or or made to feel we should act prepubescent Mm. until a wedding ring is on the finger Mm. and then immediately after please do not have any any sexual confidence sexual curiosity don't even think about having safe mental mentally safe sex just get baby, get baby, have a baby, get pregnant. Mm. It's how so how soon after Sorry. did you have a baby? That's right, you can say that on here. I got married at 25. I think we had baby 30, 31, my first one. So we didn't mm-hmm. have babies immediately. But that is the pressure. And I, and I knew not to because I knew I was still working through things through myself. Mm. And it was going away and doing more work and doing more work. It's, you know, some things like accessing the secret. I remember get, uh, reading the secret around 29. I'd already done a lot of work around the kind of law of attraction stuff, but that alone is not enough. Like you no. cannot positive affirmation your bloody life better. I'm sorry. No. You've got to change a behavior. Yeah. You can't change a behavior without understanding what's going on for you, what's triggering you. Yeah. So I can say I don't want to be the mum, the shouty mum. And I used to say that because I used to feel like I was a really shouty mum. Mm. why was it why was I triggered right so without understanding that I couldn't positive affirmation myself out of that Mm. um and then we were at a I'm pretty confident I'd done some more therapy and maybe 
together we've done a little bit of work and then we're in a really great space before we conceived our first baby mm. um, and we'd realized slowly through kind of working together in understanding the importance of communication time away from the extended family because we lived with the extended family when we were married um date nights whatever that that is really important for us in terms of connection piece mm. um and he was aware of the, the trauma growing up what I knew was quite black and white trauma mm. uh and having a parent that has that had depression and it was really widely known in the community that my mom had depression because mm. it was such a thing right to call someone mental mm. she was labeled ostracized um and in hindsight like that's really hurtful because you just can't connect I found it really difficult to connect until I had my first child and then recognized that I myself was experiencing postnatal depression so it gave mm. us a, it gave us something to bridge the kind of gap, that trauma gap mm. so I can ask you a really weird question just because yeah tell me I about like what, what does postnatal depression feel like because some people that might be listening maybe weren't aren't not aware that they experienced it or yeah yeah so what was that like <clears throat> so having postnatal depression made me recognize where I had depression throughout my 20s and 30s mm. 20s and 30s I would just go and hibernate because I had no dependent I had nobody looking to me to feed them I could eat I could sleep I could do avoidance behaviors I could journal I could do creativity I could make candles I would sew clothes I was a very creative hands on create creative person drawing art when I had my first baby, I would be so reluctant to go out. I would just think of the thousand things that could go wrong if I took baby out. Mm. And I was exclusively... Hypervigilance. Yeah, hypervigilance, negative self-talk, catastrophizing, a lot of catastrophizing. Yes. Um, what do I need to pack in the bag? Where am I going to park? And the parking thing has persisted since then now. Like mm. I still will check parking and I ask lots of women in my little like local East London mums group over WhatsApp. Guys, did anyone else do this? And it's like a joke. Like, I do it. it. <laughs> I don't even... Like we need to do our recce's. <laughs> yeah. But I think it, so something that I've realized is a lot of people that have experienced significant trauma do struggle with the, the driving and that can be a real yeah. trigger because it could be unsafe, right? So that's what we're trying to save ourselves from. Yeah. So conversely, driving was something that really I prouded myself as my independence and my I'm not going to be one of those dependent women. And this is my thing. And then boom, when it happened to me recently where I had a panic attack on the M25 driving alone after sunset, I was like, what the? And I think everyone found that really unusual for me. Um, and again, it was um, it all comes down to the mindset and the things I've been saying to myself in the week. And I wasn't doing some of the stuff that you obviously help clients learn to do. Why do we need a coach? Why do we need to turn up every week? Why can't we just do the work ourselves? Because we won't. Because the moment we get comfortable, we'll stop meditating. We'll stop looking after our body and what we eat. We'll stop journaling. We'll stop doing the breathing or the cold showers. Whatever modality you're using, whatever tool you're using, our subconscious will go back into the, that pattern that we learned. So that's why it happens to me for a period of seven days in the half term where you're distracted because you're parenting. Yeah, so you're not doing Ooh. as much self-care. Yeah, panic attack on the M25. Mm. Tiredness, overexertion, didn't put mm. them into summer clubs, like um, holiday camps. That's why we have the trauma spaces. That's why we have the coaches. That's why we have accountability um, and, the, and the reminders. Mm. So what what's interesting as well, when you're talking about, you know, what happened after you had your baby and got postnatal but before that I mean and like you like at the end of the day doing creative stuff is self-care it's connecting with your inner child you were getting help as well like you kind of got like you said you got into a good space with your husband um but then what naturally happens when you become a mother is that that this this small person needs so much of your time and your energy so you become yeah. last on that list which is then yeah. you're depriving yourself of your own love. And then yeah. I guess the depression starts to go up again, right? Yeah. But 
but massively because you're overtired and the amount of guilt that women experience when they're not taking care of their children if they're going oh out for, God, walk for yeah. 10 minutes it's insane like oh I bet you could hear this from clients all the time I'm like yeah. you can do 15 minutes you can do yeah. 15 minutes but that's the thing so I I think that's maybe one of the big things about postnatal depression is that you are so deprived of all of that energy yeah. for yourself because you've literally just brought this person into the world, given them everything that was in your body and continuing yeah. to keep them alive. But it's just it's just like putting a rocket up it all, really. Yeah. You've 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 nailed it. It's physically exhaustive, it's emotionally exhaustive. I'm a I'm a peer support worker, like a post a peri postnatal support worker right mm. it's so wonderful when you do the training you realize have the conversations with your partner mm. once baby's born if we are thinking to exclusively breastfeed when will i get respite who will do the night feed day feed will you be working going back to work after two weeks three weeks four weeks six weeks who will be paying for childcare? At which age would we like to put them into childcare? Do you even want to use childcare? Are we going to make time for ourselves? Are we going to trust anyone to leave the baby? Because I feel if some, if I, I didn't tell anybody, this is the other thing we do with South Asian women. We are super women. We try to ride it out alone. Mm, but you need to support now. I mean, even yeah. if, like, if I just kept going at... alone, I wouldn't tell anyone. Wouldn't tell anyone. If, I don't know if this is your experience, but even when I think about my parents, when they had me, I mean, we lived with my grandparents, so they had lived in support to support them. Um, and they didn't really have much choice because my mum had to go back to work early because they didn't have that kind of money. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's the thing, she, just because she had no choice. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure she wouldn't have wanted to do that. Um, but, you know, I love you, I think, mom. <laughs> but I, think I, that's, I think that's the other thing as well is, um, you know, it's OK to like. Uh, get help like get someone to do your housework get somebody to like come in and give you one hour but you could pay this person so you could just go out for a walk and do something like it's okay to hand yeah. over cash to get somebody to help you out right that's part of the journey we just think. don't mm. we don't want to hand over cash for therapy to feel better mm. <laughs> like never mind look after your kids for a bit <laughs> it's, it's like um it, our money, our money belief, mm. again, linked to our own traumas. We try to do everything ourselves. And I would want to do the laundry and I didn't want to give the baby. And I didn't want, you know, I didn't want my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law, and I didn't want anyone to take my baby. It was, it's just become so bizarre. So postnatal was, I want to do everything myself. I want to be superwoman because this is how we're raised, right? To be high achieving, high achieving, high achieving. To be a good enough mum, right? Yeah. I don't want to nap when they're napping because I want to do other things. I do want to nap when they're napping because I'm really tired. I want to make all the food from scratch. I also want to do the breastfeeding. I also want to do the sterilizing. I don't want to ask anyone to make me food. I don't want to eat processed food. Oh shit, my body, I feel like it's not going back. It's not bouncing back. It's not bouncing back. It's not bouncing back. This doesn't fit me. Okay, I'm going to try and be even more super I'm going to try and start working out now. It's endless. <laughs> you just, are you even present? Like, are you ever present? Mm. And in, and with my first son, I feel like, God, I missed out so much time, like, where I was just in distraction, avoidance. Mm. So your baby is safe, you're safe, but you're distracted and you're avoidant. Mm. I've got a really weird question to ask you, but just because oh, I'm not even more, yeah, yeah. I just, um, so obviously, um, you know, when you, and because you know lots about trauma, so it's great to ask you. So, you know, when you become a mum and you're attaching to your baby um, and that love that you feel for them. But when you've experienced attachment trauma yourself for your family, when you've experienced that, like that must be playing out as well when you're trying to connect to your child or, um, you know, regulate with them. And yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I really feel that's got to be a factor there. So but you don't realise it. I'm already a traumatised individual because there's no way I was, I had removed even a, even a, a tiny portion of my trauma before having a baby. Mm. Then I go into an emergency C-section scenario. <laughs> right oh god so that's another trauma so but i got to do skin to skin um I, and i don't know do you know what it, it's because i was breastfeeding and there's this automatic access man to this oxytocin mm. maybe it's like oxytocin on tap right mm. 
Mm. And you do skin to skin, which regulates their heartbeat with your heartbeat. But I'm a shallow breather, so I don't know what the hell he picked up because I swear he's picked up shallow breathing from me, right? <laughs> it, like I didn't do the significant work until around three, four years ago. So he yeah. was already like four or five, right? But because I was breastfeeding, you kind of do already build up that. you. Mm. Even if you're not as open to building the bond, you do build a bond. Yeah, sure. But like, a, but it's so not the same as when I've had my second child. Sure. But then they've got distinctly really different personalities as well. Mm. It's because when you're when you're attaching with your child from a secure place, obviously, um, which is really hard to do when you've like experienced trauma until you've got healthier within yourself I mean, that's probably why I didn't want to hand him over to anyone ever yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. like Anx- so I, I guess you're anx- it's because it's anxious attachment it's like you get all disorganized you get so afraid that you're going to lose them and something's going to happen so you must yeah. hold on to them and yeah. then that that could train him to be like find that all a bit too much or yeah like and you have to same. give them the best and the most effect like, the care and you can't put them in any safeguarding risk like it's that it's that mm. level of like whoa mm. yes <laughs> translate that to a child um when I started doing the deeper work around the kind of three 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 years ago like now I have like such a different relationship and I try to practice a, a level of um non-attachment because mm. and this kind of links into my faith and even though I'm not religious, I like parts of Sikhism around the non-attachment and recognizing ego, but you know, we don't owe them, they're not our possessions and stuff like that. Um, and I think that really helps as a parent because you're learning from them, they're learning from you, but there's no ownership there. And that's hard. And I'm here mm. to facilitate his journey until the point where he may decide to just fly the nest, do his own thing. That's kind of what the so, aim is and I'll choose that's really great though isn't it like, then he gets to be who he truly is rather than the way we were brought up which was be who yeah. we want you to be <laughs> always I always focus on that I'm always like go to their lens go to their lens go to their lens they're living a little world they're trying to navigate and just empowering them and again that also means they need to be around other people not you I couldn't wrap this child in cotton wool which is probably what I was trying to do right mm. and you cannot. When I realized that I needed the break and that I wanted to put them into nurse, put him into nursery, I guess it started leveling it out, right? Because you you have this, you will go and check out the nurseries, it's massive hypervigilance, hypervigilance. But children need a rounded sense of the world. And you are not going to give that to them if it's just you and five other people. Yeah, it's protecting you them. Need to allow them exactly to experience other people. Mm. And even though we we are cycle breakers because we're dealing with our trauma, we're empowering them and giving them a voice, which is what we didn't have. They are in no no doubt going to have to deal with their own trauma, mm. whether yeah. it's intergenerational, whether it's hereditary, or whether it's the because, world. But yeah, because I'm COVID, still dealing for with mine. Yeah. Oh my yeah, god, that would have yeah. affected so many of them. I like. There's nothing yeah. that you can do about stuff, and there's crazy stuff. And I've in come the world to terms time. with that mm. that it will always be acceptable that we are going to open up for them so yeah postnatal is different because you cannot detach from the world to cope with your depressive feelings Mm. um and if you go out and get the therapy you have got to put in the work and this is with everything you can't just show up to a class think it's gonna be right you've got to put in that work you've got to make that commitment Mm. and with my second with postnatal depression we'd give, be, been given a leaflet and I'd given it to hubby and I've done an Instagram live with a um, psychotherapist who specializes in postnatal um, and the mentally healthy mummy I gave it to my husband I was like don't, like something don't feel right I call it the darkness and I think seasonally November through to February I'm just not at my peak mm. he looked through the leaflet and he was like no I don't think you've got this because I don't think those leaflets really capture women of colour and the way it, the way we will translate it. Yeah, because the it's also what's going on in, and what is what's going on. It's also what's going on inside, right? So that's the yeah. thing, right? It's what's going on inside, like how low somebody. We, 
yeah yeah because there's been I, I think I heard of someone um not that long ago actually since I started the podcast where she took her own life and that, and and she had small children but no one knew she wasn't okay and that's kind of yeah. very common so common and and as women of color because a lot of us have high performing anxiety we just look on the surfaces we really got it together he did say when we were doing that live he's like I just thought god is she going to be a psychopath like is she going to be mental is she going to sit in bed and just be non-functional mm. so he, he his perception of what mental health and postnatal depression looks like in a woman was the stereotypes that we have picked up yeah crazy because that's why I had to ask you like I just feel like people don't realize they've even got it because of those stereotypes of what postnatal is and exactly. um, and really it's just depression after having a child I mean that's, that's what it. we're talking about here and it could just be like like a significant trauma has just happened to your body which is just going to have and you can have it during it's perinatal mm. you can have perinatal depression you can have it during your pregnancy Mm. people kind of um, stereotypically think that pregnancy is really really magical time but actually it's a very significantly challenging time so mm. you in pregnancy may have people caring for you supporting you partners cooking your meals and when you've had the baby it kind of changes and that's why in our peer support role we have to have these conversations to set expectations between partners because mm. it can go from pregnancy and, and and what you are as a couple to the other way mm. so he, for him to think that even though I'm there in that postnatal trauma post postnatal depression thinking it's again I'm finding it hard to get out with with my little one I want to I want to but I'd rather just stay at home I'd find people to pick up my eldest from nursery to drop him to me so I didn't have to leave mm. I what got me out of it was uh, improving access to adult therapy like I app through NHS because I didn't have access to like Instagram and these pages like I wasn't on Instagram then so and then she did a uh, low level cognitive behavioral therapy so we look at the hypervigilance and we start to do reframes and and it worked really well I really connected with my my therapist she was a woman of color she was newly practicing but it's no different to the work that we do is I'm not going to put them in the same category, but as coaches, we do a lot of that work with around reframes and just honoring how we feel. Mm. Where does it come from? Yeah. How can we break down that task to make it more manageable and plausible? Yeah. And God, like on the other side of it, it's like a completely different world. Like, mm. but there's no moment that you can describe as when you come out of it. No, it's a journey, isn't it? So yeah, hmm. and you're just learning things all the time, and you know, like you know, I've been like, I, well, I've been in and out of therapy for since my twenties, but it's only, and I had a really intense therapy for like a, a good year where I focused purely on trauma, but last year when I, you know, was in a safe place in my life, like relationship and everything, that's when really weird things started to come out that I didn't even know were there before. And, you know, that unleashed some trauma from literally when my mum was holding me, like carrying me as a child. Yeah. Um, and that kind of came out of nowhere that just made me see my nervous system. And and then really weirdly, is you because know, how these things happen is as part of my own training. So I'm a trauma-informed coach. I was doing that at the same time. And I was like, I have got all of these physical symptoms. I've got everything and then like oh I, I need to really up my game with my regulation because I'd, I've been doing self-care for yeah. a long time but I need to do more more around my, yeah way more around my vagus nerve I need to like but I, I didn't know that yeah. you know, one year ago or two years and that's where it is it's the journey because you kind of pick this information up as you go along as you're healing yeah. more and more because it's like the onion. So the top layer is just recognizing we have the issue. Second layer might be just talking to someone. Third layer is all oh, these different types of things. Fourth layer might be I'm going to start going for a regular massage, or whatever. Or oh, I'm going to start practicing yoga. Like I can't even think of examples. But I'm the same. Like cold showers, humming, mm. uh, yawning, I do that all the time. low gazing. Yeah, like I I do so many different things around the vagus nerve. Like, yeah, yeah, stimulation of the vagus nerve and. 
And I love bringing this stuff into the food world because the gut bacteria dramas and people's um, weight and size, they, they associate so much to the nutrition, but actually it's the nervous system. Of course it is, because at the end of the day, and I'm sure when you were struggling with your depression, that the only tools you had in your toolbox back then was to go to towards your food, etc. So if someone says to you, I know you feel really crap, but stop eating, then what will happen when you stop eating is the trauma is going to start coming to yes. the surface, right? Then what do you do? Because your body's going to start feeling like you're going to die. That's and what's food happening. food is, I'm going to do a workshop on this very soon. Emotional eating is so vilified, but for so many women of colour, it's our only mechanism to survive trauma, to mm. get through. Mm. And I was just eating bagels, cream cheese, and pastrami every day because it was so quick, easy, and so yum. salty and so tasty. Salt, sugar, fat. We love it. And it made me feel better every day. And it meant I could just have it and it would get me through a few hours. And I just used to count down the hours until Hubby was home. Mm. Then when he was home, I just count down the hours till the kids went to bed. Then I would just sit on the sofa and do, again, more numbing exercises, watch mindless TV, red wine, cheese, whatever crap food I wanted. It's and just like that, literally, how many like years of your child's life has gone? <laughs> yeah, but because of that, and that's the thing, when you're numbing, your life just just disappears before your eyes. Yes. Um, and you haven't even got to enjoy those moments where your kids are so cute. <laughs> yes. they're, only, they're only that little and cute for such a small amount of time. And you miss out on it because of the numbing. Yes. You know, because you're not present, because you're trying to, you don't know what this pain is that you're trying to manage. Yes. Um, and now, obviously, because you've been on a journey where you are learning the tools in order to regulate so that you are able to be present with them mm. and enjoy the stage that they're at, right? Yeah, I love it. I, you know, we call it the darkness and, you know, th there's challenges and you overcome them. Then there's more and then you overcome them. And I think the problem is when we, this, when we think that there's a one-stop shop, you and I were just talking about this, once you start therapy, once you start trauma-informed coaching, once you start any of this work, you might be working with people for, you know, longer than a few months and weeks. And that's normal mm. because yeah. it really is like I'm the layers of the onion. So, God, I love it. Everything new that I learned and I get to share with my kids. I love being present. I love being in nature like you. Um, so yesterday I took them out to the park. In the past, if you were somebody that suffered postnatal depression, if you were someone that is hypervigilant, if you were someone that has anxious thoughts, the idea of the mud and the mess is going yeah. to stop you experiencing the joy. Yeah, definitely. So even if I don't have the stuff that's going to carry their boots or whatever, I just don't give two diddly dots anymore. Mm. I yeah. had to get over spilt milk and it is when your kids because i'd be like why have you dropped that i've got to clean it so women carry the mental load you'll know this man because you'll work with so many women pre and post babies it would be like you just dropped that cracker now i've got to vacuum the sofa i'm doing everything everything um and if you're breastfeeding you think you're the milk bottle the typically the male partner is the way it works or the working partner is the way it works, and you just feel like, God, it's all the time, all the time. Yeah. And it's because we've never been taught to ask for help. It's exactly what you said at the beginning. If I just ask somebody for help. And it's not just that, but you've never been taught to love yourself and take care of yourself. So you're not noticing, but actually I am so drained. I just need to go have a bath. I just need to yeah. go outside and get some fresh air for 15 minutes. I just need to hum. <laughs> like you don't know yes. those things because, and, and again, like it's and because we've grown up um, just watching our mothers that did did nothing for themselves. You know, like Absolutely. my mom was raising kids and cooking for the entire family every weekend. Like we used yeah. to have people at our house all of the time. I don't know the time, all of the time. Yeah, and how could she like that? Is just and she used to have a full time job. And she was like doing massive dinner parties. Like, I've been doing them since I've had the house. And I'm like, they're really exhausting. I don't know if I enjoy it. <laughs> I'll do one every like few months. But I was just like, mom, you used to do this every week. And we were little children. Like, yeah. that is what we grew up watching. Like spinning I, plates. And then they would look great and yeah. skinny. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I was looking at pictures like, mom, 
I just feel like they were in survival and in flight yes. all the time. Yeah, they were. I mean, they are. And then we so. were there, like, help clean. Do, do, do. And it's a, a, a cycle. And it goes mm. round and round. Mm. And I think that's why when I, before I started my business, I think, or around the same time, when I saw your YouTube video discussing your dad's suicide, I was like, <gasps> yeah, that was a long time ago now. So long ago. I was. First of all, so relieved someone's talking about these mental health. I was, well, because I knew you from school, I was like, oh my God. Like, you know, we, we see things through our own perception. We see things through our projection. And I was just like, so happy to see that this is happening, that we're doing, the, we're, we're raising awareness. Mm. So every time you speak on the podcast, and I know how hard it is because of our community that vilifies us speaking about anything that might associate with someone. Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, no, like, F you, the, the women that you're going to resonate with and the women that need you just to say shouting in the home is trauma if your body went into flight of light. Mm. I just think that people need to hear it. Definitely. And, well, one of the most important things that I do in my work, which I'm sure you've done as part of your healing journey, is to get people to connect and work with their own inner child. So do you do that as part of like being a mum as well? Because um, that is that's just a really significant part of um, of healing from trauma is to connect with that part and give that part everything that you need. And I feel like when you start to nurture that part of you, that you will naturally become a different kind of parent. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if you, that's helped yeah. you at all. All the time. And I, I love the, because when you've done masterclasses and when you did, the last thing that we did with you all together was when you read the letter, again, the letter that you wrote to you in a child. I love that work. And I did, and I focus on that in therapy too, is because like I said, sometimes we have recall. We can't recall certain things that is in our memory, clearly, because I lived that life. Um, and then, in doing that work it'll come up it'll pop up from the memory because I, I can't recall it but it's in my memory um and it would link often links back to that between the zero and seven or one of yeah yeah ones. definitely yeah um and with the kids that always you know I get down to level like if I see my kids going even near fight or flight I like literally hold them get them to honor their feelings with the emotions wheel up in our house and I just always say you're safe it's okay let it feel what you need to feel when you're ready, we can talk about it. Um, my little one's really cute now. If he sees one of us getting a little bit short or getting a little bit frustrated, we'll be like, shall we do our breathing? <laughs> oh, bless him. Oh, that's so Follow cute. my hand, because I'll do that. Breathe in and out, just to try and get them to... No, that's a good idea. Not to be shallow in it, right? So, like, so then when I'm doing it with them, I'm doing it for myself. And yeah, we just help each other like regulate yeah that's but, a, but this is amazing because you've learned how to regulate and to be healthy that then you're now showing them that which is a skill that they are like you say they're going to need in life yeah but like, there's going to be things that happen and they'll need to be able to regulate like the thing is because we weren't taught these things and then we had trauma then that meant when we've gone for a job interview or, you know, pushed ourselves for a promotion or for me, like going on a date was so triggering, like yeah. for my nervous system, because it felt so unsafe. But I just thought that was something wrong with me uh, or the person that I was going on the date with. But actually it wasn't yeah. it was just because my trauma was getting activated. And now I know, but now I know that like, I know how to deal with all of that and it's fine. But like, but I still see it now in other things though. Like, I, you know whenever I'm working with clients and I'm sure that you're the same is you know I'm my healing is being activated in a different way now so before it used to be relationships same. my business will trigger me in ways that uh, will activate my trauma my um so now you know I've turned 40 and we're starting to think about planning for a child I can already feel my hyper vigilance for it I've started creating a plan about when this baby's going to be conceived um I've also really started to give myself a plan b if I can't conceive yeah. um you know I'm already doing it my crazy's already started just like it did with going on a date <laughs> it's just different now and it's about different things but I realized the feelings are the same it's the fear yeah. it's my subconscious mind it's going back into these old behaviors and it's like it's okay I'm what am I going to do I'm going to bring myself back into the present 
um you know what can I do stop thinking yeah. about worst case scenarios you know like and it's just but it's the same work it's just a different yeah. kind of scenario that, exactly the same for me if so you kind of get to a point sometimes where you feel you're bulletproof and then something triggers you like oh, oh yeah um but I mean one of the really really big things around what's changed is I'm so much more into my spiritualism and my my, my woo woo whatever we want to call it and I've pushed myself so much into leaning into faith over fear like mm. and that shit is hard because your faith's always going to get tested like it just always is and I constantly come back to the fact that your reality is a is through the lens of your beliefs so you know for me if I'm going to a board meeting and I'm nervous because I'm going to children's board meeting board meeting at the children's school I was like it doesn't matter what anyone thinks of you it's, it's, you're going in with your lens you and then I just say shit to myself I'm like girl you're sociable you're confident you've like lived in board meetings your whole 20s like what are you scared about it's not it's not fair that's excitement be excited because mm. like we talk about right nervousness and excitement are from the same yeah it's the same feeling it's, it's, it's a physical response yeah and all the time I, in my head honestly now if I can breathe and I can calm my nervous system there's no challenge that really terrifies me I just mm. always lean into fear I'm not worried about my kids being crackheads I'm <laughs> giving them the tools that I can and what happens when a child acts out, we are unfamiliar with those emotions because some, some of us as parents haven't allowed ourselves to feel them. So kids acting out often makes parents uncomfortable. So then you try to silence, you try to, you, like me, I can try to like make them feel better, make them feel better. Like, no, actually, he needs to feel sad. Like if his cousin's getting to go to a sleepover and he's not, mm. let him experience the day. Yeah, it's so, okay. Yeah, and it's okay for them to be disappointed them. Don't the... mitigate it. Don't try to compensate it. Let him mm. feel it. Mm. And then be there for them when they want to speak it through. And then they see, oh, oh God, okay, it's not the end of the world. Like, I didn't get yeah. to go. I cried, but it's not the end of the world. That is, it's just, so this is a statement I've been doing, saying to myself this year, like a lot, is I can do difficult things. It's like things yeah. are difficult and they are uncomfortable, but I can do them. Whereas before, when you're living from a life in survival, and just yeah, trying to, fair, um, fair, fair, fair. yeah, well, you're just like, difficult things are such a challenge that you're like, I can't do that. And this is so triggering and my triggers are going to kill me. So uh, I can't, I'll, I'll just stay stuck. I'll just play small because it yeah. feels so uncomfortable in your body to step out of it. So you just kind of stay like that. And for, for anybody listening, that could be anything. It could be like, oh, you don't want to go to your first therapy session because yeah. you're so afraid of it. But the thing is, is a group that's... call, a networking meeting, a board governance meeting. Your ego is literally like, we don't know this. This is unfamiliar. You're gonna die. You're gonna die. You can. Yeah. Because your board, your ego is just here to keep us alive. Quarters always just here for us to stay. It's not real. No. <laughs> it's no. not a real thing. And the thing is, and I and I notice this with clients all the time, is that that voice and that fear and that um, instinct for survival is what will keep us very very stuck. Um, and yep. and stops us from having a fulfilling, happy, healthy life if we like yeah. it can pull you back so much. So you it's, know, like doing perfect. the thing. Yeah. If you go into that, which you could do every day, they didn't eat their food. Oh my god, they're gonna have to eating disorder. <laughs> they don't like vegetables. Oh my god, they're never gonna eat vegetables. They're gonna get cancer. Uh, they only <laughs> want to eat sweets. Oh my god, they're just gonna become a sugar addict. They're gonna become a beast. They're gonna have so many health issues. Uh, those things, like first of all, obesity is not linked to health, outcomes of health. The word obesity is self the definition like i won't even go there but basically um they slap their brother oh my god they're going to be violent they're going to be aggressive oh my god they they didn't like do well in their school they don't like learning and my, my, with my little one i'd be triggered all the time school's going to take out his bright spark the school's going to curb his wildness <laughs> stop with your <laughs> dramatization <laughs> Now yeah. I just lean into fear. I'm like, no, they just didn't want to eat their vegetables today. It's good. It's all good. So they know we, we have sometimes food. There's nothing off limits. Sometimes mm. food is sometimes. Sometimes food isn't burger every day because that's not sometimes food then, right? No, no. So um, when they hit each other, uh, just like developmental, guide them. Don't go into fear-based thinking. 
Because that's when we go into fight or flight. Don't hit your brother. Like, why are you doing that? You could turn against you. He may never want to love you and be your friend ever again in the future. And then you're going to fall out and it's going to be awful. Like my mum and her brother and, you know, they didn't talk. And then I didn't see my cousins for years. And it's just, what <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. That's, a, a that's I was just thinking like this is like when I speak to my friends and it's just like when their kids have triggered them. It's just like that. That and it's just it's just like you have just turned into your own inner child right there. That's what's just happened. Sorry, your child has now entered the argument too, rather than yeah. your adult healthy self. Or well, not even your child, it'll be like your teenage self that's like trying to be yeah. a bit more arsy about it. But it's just um it's crazy. I mean I can't I can only imagine that parenting is so hard because these little people are mirrors of your own shit reflecting back at you. <laughs> That's what they really are. I yeah. love it. And and I think that in last year, and I think COVID pushed us into such difficult circumstances, homeschooling, being with them all the time. And there might have been some depressive feeling, um, depressive episodes as parents. But one of the things I really want to impress upon people as well, you don't have to have depression and significant trauma. We're meant to experience feelings of anxiety. Like as humans, we're meant to have depressive feelings sometimes. And mm. you can still work with someone like Manpreet or around your food with me. You don't have to have a severe form of something. Mm. It could just be because occasionally when you do have a, like a down point, you don't maybe, you want to work with it and work through it better. Mm. It doesn't mean you have to work, wait until you're, you know, have like longer periods of downtime, mm. like downward feeling. I, I think what, what I find really hard just listening to mothers is that, um, you know, especially as I am not one and, and it makes me sad is that the, of how much they're betraying themselves in the name of motherhood you know like I've got to do this for them but it's like but you're not giving yourself love you're not nourishing yourself um you're neglecting yourself so much because of whatever you believe that a mother is and really that's just such a disservice to you and even like when when you talk about like lockdown and how many people were struggling during lockdown well the reason is because before they probably had little moments where there was they go for a coffee by themselves at the train on the way to work. Yeah. yeah, reading their book. You know, those moments of self-care were taken away. And then that amplifies the problem. I mean, I talk about self-care and self-love so much because it's such it's an important part of being a human being. It's just as important yes. as eating, as having water, as having shelter. It's just as yeah. important. And the trauma element is the feeling of safety within the body, which is what for all of us, we didn't get to choose what that feels like because it's different for all of us. Right? Yeah. And um, I always I, I joke with my clients, you know, because of my first seven years of life, like I could get triggered by absolutely freaking anything. And now yeah. that still happens. And I've done lots of work on myself. But when I start to push myself to have a great life, which I so, so want, like I want to have a business and I want to do this work, but that means I've got to shit myself sometimes and contact yes! people and put my face out there and do things. That are, but my body's that little girl that wants to go hide in the, in the bedroom Same. and not see anyone. But I have to be like, no, I'm meant to have, I'm meant to go for my dreams. I'm meant to go yeah. for this, you know? I, yeah. I don't know all the details. I don't know how I'm going to be a mom and be a business owner, but you know, like it's just figuring all those things yeah, now, yeah and for any mums that are listening just because you're a mum don't make your dreams small because your dreams like oh. you get to, you get to show your kids yes. how to yes. dream you get to show because them because it's monkey yeah monkey see monkey do yeah and you wearing yourself away to support them is not and I was that mum in lockdown where I couldn't exercise my self-care away from Aisha I realized why am I not just doing the yoga in front of them? Why am I hiding in a room and doing it? Oh, what? They're going to interrupt me. So what? Go back into faith. They'll climb over you. You won't do one pose perfectly. Who cares? And I've seen such a significant impact on my kids. Sometimes I wait for them to go to school and I'll meditate. It's like, no, I'm going to do it in the bed with them. Who wants to come do my meditation with me this morning? Who wants to prepare the food with me this morning? Like, you're going to make a mess. It doesn't matter. You're learning life skills. So I won't let fear of them making a mess, interrupting me, making it less perfect stop me from doing it and I'll still do things when they're not here I posted video after video I did handstand stretch breathe movement diffuser essential oil yoga 
everything after everything 2020 that lockdown I was like hell no you're not taking me down like yeah you're like I'll do whatever I gotta be the best version of me to be the best version of them like I felt for everyone and everything we'd obviously just suffered a bereavement as well so it was like if I don't watch this yeah Yeah. and also I guess for them as well they've had a massive bereavement as well and just to support them in that um yeah yeah that's just so um so like we wait for something so traumatic and so significant and so tick box to do something that really matters and I don't like using fear-based psychology to onboard clients like do you you don't wait until you've got a disease like I don't like to do that because I think do it because you want a better life exactly the things that you said Mm. and what's amazing about your story is that which I think every mum that's listening that should be inspired by like you your your kids are how old when you started your business how old were they oh gosh um I think three and five. Yeah. So you're three and five year old having therapy, quit your job to yeah, try was, to and serve at the time and help I was other studying, women. Yeah, I was taking a full-time job, studying two qualifications, managing the childcare. And I remember at the time thinking, God, I did this to get to have more time to be able to be the pick up and drop off mum. And at the moment I'm literally flat out. And now I'm, you know what, I am two years on and i I'm there. Mm. That, that that dream at one point was like like is it going to be attainable and you just got to have so much faith Mm. you've got to go into the discomfort like you said you've got to lean into that I I I I still have social anxiety at the minute where I don't know someone and I can't have someone holding my hand I don't want to go into group settings where Mm. I'm feeling unfamiliar I don't know people which is why I haven't done an in-person event Mm, I'm I'm struggling with that yes it's because of lockdown it's because well I was always a bit like that anyway yes being out of the game for so long yeah I think a lot of people are struggling with social anxiety and and I and I I literally was like I really want to do that and then it will come that and the opportunity will arise and I just get so I'll either reach out to my network and be like uh anyone want to come to this with me and this Mm. week I've decided because I've seen more sunshine too sunshine just I love sunshine helps me (laughs) I need to get my light lamp. I'm not going to play those games next year. I'm on the light lamp. Um, and it might be other mums, but yeah, I, I'm going to try and get back into it because mm. like tomorrow's International Women's Day. So there's like a small get together locally. I, I know the place. I'm familiar with the place. I'm going to do it. Yeah, do it. Don't let fear. Do it. This has been so great. I, we've gone I over, but. I just realised how quickly. Yeah. It it's goes. Nice. I love talking to you. Me too. Is there anything else that you want to cover? Um, about motherhood about your journey healing I do think number one is asking for the help mm-hmm. informal and formal and finding those circles which might be via the help like you have a community where you can just be freaking honest mm. I have I, I've made women's groups like whatsapp informal chats because we can just say SOS. I don't want to take the kids to the park on my own. I'm telling you, I don't enjoy it, man. Sometimes I just want to kick and hit each other. I don't like it. If I go with other mums, with their kids, they tend to play differently. There's a different dynamic. They'll probably pick up. I'm more relaxed. They're more relaxed. Ask for help. Professional, informal. Then find the safe spaces and stay away. Run as fast as you can intuitively from the people that are making you feel ugly yeah away away I think yeah. those are the three things because if you do that you'll find them and then you'll get your therapy if you run away from the things that you're scared that are, are, are triggering you and not great for you you'll you probably get towards a group of women that are freaking awesome and then knowing that they're awesome and they're honest you'll probably opt for some therapy mm, that's and so true we have a traumatized society I keep telling everyone I was like it's like man I think we have a traumatized society oh we absolutely so please do. do not think you are exempt the whole from and by the way that is the whole freaking planet it's not just our culture yeah. it's it's all of us the I mean we are look at death. look at the world and what's happening right now like let's just look at that like what's going on in Ukraine you know um we've just come out of a pandemic the way that the, you know systems and are like dealing with these things is madness like yeah. you know why isn't we should all be learning about emotional regulation in, at school and everywhere like where is where is this why are we not talk, you know doctors should be talking about nervous system they're not you know yeah. so there's a lot of systems yeah. there that are just not doing the thing so you know 
we have to the more that we le- learn and heal then we get to just like you do with your communities I do with mine that word spreads out more and more that we can be yeah. healthier ourselves and, and show up in a different way um the other thing I wanted to ask you was how pe- I know what you kind of mentioned how you help people but how they can work with you and the things that, yeah. that you do um I think the community aspect is number one I, you work with people you resonate with I do the same and it's a it's a mutual appreciation vibe intuition so my community tends to be strong with women who just get each other get me we get we're all on our journeys so I have a food freedom community for food lovers basically just to love food find a place where you can have access to support without having to really commit so it's like again from our society we have a lot of non-committal issues <laughs> <laughs> so true. Um, and then I have a signature 10 step program which spans over like uh 10 to 12 weeks, um, which people can join at any point when they're ready. And people know when they want that accountability, that week to week support mm-hmm. versus I want to be a part of a community and have some access, but not so intensive. And yeah. I have a telegram broadcast channel now. <laughs> That's exciting. Which is free. And you can just you can just there basically. I have nuggets of rav isms. Fabulous. Well, I'll make sure I put all of those into the episode notes. But one thing I just thought of that you said earlier, which was really a massive point, the you know, the third thing that you said about um staying away from people, situations that make you feel iggly, something that's really been coming up a lot for me and just I'm noticing with my clients is that our bodies will tell us when somebody doesn't feel safe or good to us. <laughs> But then our brains will be like, oh, is it in my head? Am I making this up? Oh, they haven't done anything that bad. Listen to your body. If it's not feeling safe, there's probably a reason. So stepping away um, and just sort of taking care of yourself so that you can figure out what that is about, I think is a really good shout. Because, yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing being a mum, that's such a strong, intuitive thing to have anyway. And then yeah. if, if, if people that are listening that are part of wider South Asian communities where there's often some toxic relatives and demands and all that kind of stuff you've got to start putting those boundaries in place right because that affects you being a mum right and it will be family yes exactly I mean you have a new mum your family's triggering you you really want to get your support network in place because it's okay to not like family Hmm. and it's It's okay okay to find your people that are not family like you know we're sort of conditioned to not to not to go to our own but actually our own are the ones that have got the same trauma as us so Mm -hmm. going to a different set of people would probably be more helpful go and find your people outside of that unit if you need to and they can be friends which is what I have and that allows me then to be able to be present with my family who have trauma but without Mm. being triggered so Mm. or being able to manage my triggers when they do trigger me Mm. yeah massive part yeah my whole postnatal um my mum's groups are non-family homies Mm. That's important. Well, this has been fabulous. Anything else that you want to say? No, I just want to say thank you. I think you'll love the work that you do. You're always a massive part of the neat nutrition community because I think it's priceless. I love what you do. Keep doing it. Don't stop. Don't stop. Thank you. And thank you so much for sharing your journey because you are a cycle breaker. You're working on your own trauma. And because of that, you're developing deeper services, right? For your clients. Yeah. How it started as one thing and it's evolving more and more into um what you've done for yourself right in a, at a deeper yeah. level which is why when you all keep healing as somebody that offers services is it's really important it is thank you my pre thank you so much thank you and there we have it guys an episode completed i hope you enjoyed it and it raised a load of awareness in your mind there was alarm bells going you were all like ding that's totally me because that's what i was like when i started this journey and that is the start of the process finding out this information and realizing it has happened in your own life so i really hope it was helpful and before the next episode coming out next wednesday be sure to check us out on instagram so it's hearts underscore underscore happiness also we have a youtube channel where i share the videos i create for instagram on so you can check that out they come on about once a week and then we also have a facebook group if you want to join to carry on the conversation i want to create a community where we're all talking about our very real experiences and traumas and then there is also my website called heartshappiness.co.uk which you can check out 
to join our mailing list so that as I create new services and support tools for you all, you're the first to find out. And I have a freebie on there, so definitely check that out. It's five books that transformed my healing. So if you really want to kickstart and you know you're liking the content in here, these books are like the basis of so much of my knowledge. So definitely check that out. And I will speak to you next week. I'm so excited to continue this journey with you to help you to find your own heart's happiness. Take care.